So welcome back from spring break. I hope all of you had some time off. I know some were probably working, some getting caught up on assignments. Um, I had a couple days off, so it was great. We're going to talk today about the electronic health record from the health management information systems, and it's going to follow along with the chapter three I had you guys read prior to this lecture. And health management information systems is a theory component that provides an introduction to healthcare applications and the systems that use them. All of these revolve around health information technology standards, data structures, enterprise architectures, all within healthcare organizations. And we kind of had talked about some of this in all of our previous lectures. So we're going to define at a little bit more detail the EMR versus the EHR and also the attributes and functions. Now that you've had some database background and some data validity and data collection and workflow detail, I want you to think of all of that as we discuss um, this lecture and how it pertains back to that EMR, which is really what all of the support, security, access, informatics, where it all sits is what we're referring to as this record for the patient. So the objectives are going over the similarities and differences between the EMR versus EHR, the attributes and functions of an EHR and an EMR, how that can be organized, and it will follow a paper record even in the electronic world, and how the EHR is affecting patient safety, efficacy of care practices, and patient outcomes. So as a way of introduction to a health record, let's identify why patients or medical records exist in the first place. And if you recall, um, according to Dr. Reiser, the purpose of a patient record is to recall observations, inform others, instruct students, gain knowledge, and monitor performance, justify interventions. So all of the care that we're doing for the patient revolves around this data that we are collecting on them and how we're going to disseminate that data once we've stored it. Medical record is a way of communicating between the staff and managing patient care. It allows for an integrated view of the patient data. So integrated, it's instead of having to look multiple places for that information, it's all hopefully residing in one location with one access point. Patient medical record is legal. It's a legal business record for the healthcare provider. And according to AHIMA, um, on maintaining the legal EHR, it's pointed out in an article called Maintaining a Legally Sound Health Record. This article states that it must be maintained in a matter that follows applicable regulations, accreditation standards, professional practice standards, and legal standards. And if you remember from our earlier lecture where we talked a lot about HIPAA and Joint Commission and CMS, the accreditation voices versus regulation there you go, your regulation, your accreditation standards, professional practice standards, and legal standards. So historically, patient records have been paper-based. However, more and more healthcare providers are moving away from paper-based to the adoption of electronic form. And there's two terms associated, of course, with this electronic form, as we've talked about over and over. We have the electronic medical record or the electronic health record. And according to the report for defining health information technology terms, an electronic record of health-related information on the individual that can be created, gathered, managed, consulted by authorized clinicians and staff within one, keyword, within one healthcare organization. That's the definition of the EMR. So remember, it's one organization. That same report also stated that this health-related information encompasses the health, wellness, administrative data, and information derived from public health and scientific research. So research is going to be a big thing coming up when we start collecting all that data. If you recall, we were talking about how much data is being collected. Somebody has to be out there managing it and understanding what to do with it. It doesn't do us any good to have it if we aren't using it. Research, the improvement of patient outcomes, disease management, these are all things that we're going to use this data for that falls under research. It includes past and present observations, 
facts documented in the provision of health care that may be related to preventing illness, promoting wellness, and used for the process of informing consent so that patients really understand what they're agreeing to and why the care is being offered to them. The electronic medical record is a record of medical care created, managed, and maintained by one organization. It does not mean a single physical location, it just means one organization, one overreaching organization. There may be many instances when the information is shared among multiple facilities and still be within one EMR. For example, the electronic record used in a physician practice with several offices is still an EMR when all the sites are using the same proprietary data structure and architecture and the information is not moving outside the confines of the organization. So again, if we talk about our current situation here in Missoula, if I share that information with the what we call the community physician group, which is part of community medical center, if I share that information with our outpatient rehab therapies, if I share it with our cath lab, it is all still the community medical record, community medical center organization, it's our record, therefore it's an EMR. If I start sharing that information out there in that cloud, out in the HIE, the health information exchange with St. Patrick Hospital, or the patient um, is being transferred to Spokane, Sacred Heart, then it becomes the EHR. purpose of the EMR, lost my clicker, sorry. So the purpose of the EMR is to provide an electronic equivalent of the legal medical record for use by the providers and staff within that one healthcare organization. EMR is understood to be a specific business needs for care, reimbursement, disclosure, follow all the regulation and rules, by the federal, state, and accrediting entities to contain information as defined by the provider organization. So if we really break what I just said apart, we're looking at that reimbursement, the disclosure, regulation, and rules. All of that's where HIPAA comes in, right? It's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act that says we can share this information without your consent if it's for reimbursement and the continuity of your care. What we can't do is give that information just to someplace else that's asking for it. It has to be like in a consultation thing. So um, St. Pat's can't necessarily just call our ER and ask for the ER record from a month ago just because you're back in their ER with the same complaint. It has to be related to providing that care. St. Pat's doesn't need your consent in order to call the radiologist or a cardiologist or a neurologist to follow up with the reasons why you're in their ER again. Okay. Um, the electronic rec medical record encapsulates a record of medical care provided in a single organization. So the other word we can use for single is intra, I-N-T-R-A, that means within the organization. So then there's the EHR, which was defined by the key health information technology terms as an electronic record of health-related information on an individual that conforms to nationally recognized inter, inter, I-N-T-E-R, interoperability standards, and that can be created, managed, consulted, and authorized by clinicians and staff across more than one healthcare organization. It's a repository of individual health records that reside in numerous information systems and locations. EHRs are intended to support efficient, high-quality, integrated health care. Independent, there's another key term, independent of the place and time that health care delivery. So we had a discussion about databases, and we're talking about how even, even within our EMR community hospital, they're existing in different locations. Now, it's still the Community Medical Center record, so I don't want to confuse you with the EMR part, but the, the point was is that it has to be interoperable. We in the EMR world, when it's in one location, have to make it interoperable, but we're also driven by this High Tech Act to make it interoperable within facilities, inter-facilities, so St. Pat's to Community, Community to Sacred Heart, St. Pat's to Harborview, all of this needs to be interoperable when we're sharing this information. Okay, it's intended to support um, the 
all of this in the healthcare delivery and consequently it's part of the health information technology infrastructure which are areas that you all are more familiar with. Purpose is to provide an electronic equivalent of the individual's health record for use by the providers across more than one healthcare organization. Inter-organization, I-N-T-E-R, organizational, that's your EHR, is two or more unrelated organizations that contribute to the record, which becomes an aggregation of one record focused around a person's comprehensive health history. Remember we talked about patient-centric. That's where we're focused around the person. Okay. rather than being one provider's record or one organizational record. However, to get there, all the contributors must be able to send and receive this information using the same standards that facilitate the interoperable exchange of health-related information or the health information exchange um, requirements. And EHR is intended to support efficient, high-quality, integrated health care Again, independent of where that healthcare delivery takes place. And according to the National Alliance for Health Information Technology, the principal difference between the EMR and EHR is the ability to exchange information interoperably. An EMR aligns with the prevailing state of electronic records today, whether the record is branded as an EMR or EHR. Okay? But the movement of the industry is toward electronic records that are capable of using nationally recognized interoperability standards, and that's the key defining component of an EHR. So what are some of the categories of the EMR and EHR? So if we look at the data we're collecting, these can be pretty much defined in these four categories. We've got your demographic, which is the patient, very specific patient's information, their name, um, their date of birth, phone number, that's about the patient. Then we have their socioeconomic, and sometimes this, this can cross into demographic, and the two can be kind of interchanged, but really socioeconomic, if you break that word apart, it's their social status, where they, where they are, which um, can affect whether or not they're employed, um, their, their social culture, of the, the society, so their marital status, where they live in a particular area, whether they're from the projects in Detroit or whether they're from, you know, the South Hills in, in Mansion Heights. So that's their socio status. Um, their race plays into that. Um, religion plays into that for all of their cultural things, their sexual orientation. It's very important to know when you when you talk about socioeconomic, how we're treating these people. And it, it really can make a difference if you've got a young, thin male with lesions on his skin, if he's got a sexual orientation of biracial or homosexual versus a sworn heterosexual, we might look at them differently. Um, go down some different paths of treatment, we may both come to a diagnosis of being HIV positive or having um, acquired immune deficiency sy syndrome or AIDS, but we really need to look at how did that happen then. And we have to go back and look at their history. Is it because of their sexual orientation? And if they're adamant they're heterosexual, then we got to start asking them about their drug use or about blood transfusions or some other things that could have happened. Were they out of the country? Did they, you know, do they work in healthcare and were exposed to, um, bloodborne pathogens of some sort. So we take all of these things into account when we're looking at the data to do the health care for the patient, but we're also looking at the socioeconomic data and their demographics, so how old they are, um, marital status. It's proven that people that are married live longer. Remember back when we were talking about William Farr and his statistician with the vital statistics that he did. He was showing that information 150 years ago. So um, it really plays part, and when we look at public health, we really need to take into account the socioeconomic factors. It really makes a difference when we're trying to pinpoint where a disease outbreak may have come from or how as a nation we're going to provide health care to the projects of Detroit or to the single moms. Um, we need to gather the accurate data. We need to have valid data and it needs to be relative, and that's where some of these socioeconomic figures are coming in that are related to meaningful use. We also have our financial data, so who's paying? We Obviously, we got to send a bill. We can't give away our health care for free. 
So we need to know who's going to pay or who's the guarantor. Sometimes when it comes to children or people with abilities or disabilities, their guarantor may not be themselves. It may not be a parent. They may be a ward of the state. If you are a prisoner, your guarantor is actually going to be the, the state of Montana or the prison system that you're from. So that's your guarantor versus insurance that you might have versus self-pay. And then, of course, clinical information. That data is all the information that has to do with the care that we're providing you, right? It's everything from your vital signs, your past medical history, your medications, your allergies, procedures, all of that. Subjective and objective observations. So in your reading, you read about SOAP, which is your subjective and objective. Those are the first two letters of that. So remember, your subjective findings are a what the patient is telling you their symptoms are. They say they have a headache. They say that they feel nauseated. Um, your objective findings are that they have diarrhea and what color it is or that they vomited 100 cc's of bloody emesis. That's objective. It's something you can actually see. It's tangible. It's the data numbers that you get off your blood pressure machine where subjective is them telling you that they have high blood pressure. Subjective is what the patient says about their headache because of the way they're feeling. Um, so there's your subjective and your objective data, and that's all relative to clinical information. So just this little chart, very quickly, you guys can read this on your own when you review it, but it's just breaking it down in a little bit different visual comparison. Um, and it explains how the integration happens. And you can read the notes that are on here about how that does. I'm not going to spend a lot of time reviewing it for you. So according to the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services fact sheet, electronic health records at a glance, these electronic health records improve care by enabling functions that paper records cannot deliver. So we've always done this on paper, right? So what makes the difference with the EHRs? Well, they can make patients' health information available when and where it's needed. So historically, 3 o'clock in the morning, when we don't have medical records clerks, we've had to call and try to find a house supervisor, somebody with a key to the locked medical records that understands how they're stored and be able to look up a patient. It takes a while. Sometimes it would take 30 minutes or longer. If we were waiting for these records to come from another facility and somebody's in crisis, that time can feel like an eternity. EHRs bring patients' total health information together in one place. Keep it current. They don't, clinicians don't need to worry about drugs or treatments prescribed by another provider because they can see it. They, they have this information right in front of them, and they can coordinate the care, right? We keep saying coordinated care, interdisciplinary care across the continuum. EHRs support a better follow-up for patients. As an example, that when they've been to a, a clinic visit or hospital stay, instructions and information for the patient can effortlessly be provided. And effortlessly is kind of a, a big word to use, but for the most part, it is fairly effortlessly. And reminders for those appointments can be automatically generated to the patients on many cases. EHRs improve patient and provider convenience. Patients can have their prescriptions ordered and ready even before they leave a provider's office. That's all part of that computerized physician order entry and e-prescribe that we've talked about. Insurance claims can be filed immediately from the provider's office. I mean, imagine, I just the other day, I went and saw a provider. I had to get the piece of paper. Then I had to go online. I submitted my form. I had to scan it so I could submit it electronically. I waited a week. I notified them. They said they still hadn't received it, so I scanned it again. Then they tell me I've got a duplicate because they finally received the first one I submitted. Oh, my goodness, what a process. In this world, when I left the office, it would have all been submitted. Wouldn't that have been fabulous? I would have already had my reimbursement check in my hand, not had to worry about getting a bill. So they can link information with patient computers to point to additional resources. Patients can be more informed and involved with their EHRs as they're used to help identify additional web resources. So remember, the EHR can go across the continuum. Components of that can even fall into the personal health record. Um, the EHR can talk to the personal health record in some instances, or that would be the euphoria, the utopia um, situation where because you prescribed me a med in the ER, it would automatically fall to my patient health record so that I could update it on the web and I could maintain it where it exists as the patient. EHRs contain or transmit 
information, they will also compute it. So a qualified EHR doesn't merely contain the record of the medications, but it will also automatically check for problems whenever a new me medication is ordered and alert for the potential side effects. So that's your clinical decision support, if you remember CDS, clinical decision support. That's part of a qualified EHR, one of the components that must be able to do some of these checkings and automatic validations that we've talked about. They can improve safety through their capacity to bring all of the patient's information together and automatically identify safety issues, providing this decision support capability to assist clinicians. The final group of ways where an EHR can improve care, according to the Centers for Medicaid Services, are delivering more information and more directions while reducing paperwork time for providers. And an example of this is that the EHR can be programmed for easy and automatic delivery of information that needs to be shared with public health agencies or quality measurement. So when we talked about accreditation, we talked about the reporting to the state, the tumor registry, the trauma registry, all of these things can be set up to be automated instead of transposing from one system to another or from electronic to paper or from paper to paper and submitting these information out to these registries and accrediting agencies. Now it can happen electronically and be done one time, one, one click does it all. They can improve privacy and security, so when we talk about HIPAA, and if you remember, privacy and security also follows with accessibility. So with proper training and effective policies, electronic records can be more secure than paper. They're also reducing costs through reduced paperwork, improved safety, reduce duplication of testing, and improve health care through the delivery of more effective health care. So remember we talked about the efficiencies um, and, and how a quality, quality data can actually improve strategic planning and the overall fiscal responsibility um, within an organization. EHRs can be encrypted and stored on password protected systems. In addition, they can have their firewalls. Um, access can be controlled and a, an audit trail of who's been accessing you know currently a paper record sitting in at the nurse's station late at night the cleaning man could come up the the housekeeper could come through and open that chart somebody's family member wandering around bored at midnight has the potential to be able to look through paper um, without anybody even knowing that happened or not having any idea who did it this way there's always an audit trail when it's electronic and you'd have to have an access code to get it. You can't just go by and flip open a record and start thumbing through pages of paper. So overall, they have a potential for improvements in patient safety and quality. However, they're not an automatic result of implementing an EHR. If you remember some of the disasters that happened with poorly implemented EHRs that we've talked about in previous lectures. So the electronic record is not just an electronic version of the paper record, but it has additional attributes and properties that paper cannot do or does not have. The Health Information Management System Society, or HIMSS, described eight attributes of the electronic health record in their HIMSS report, and the first two attributes are providing secure, reliable, real-time access to the patient record, where and when it's needed, and also capturing and managing episodic or longitudinal health care record information. Episodic and longitudinal, so it's trying to do this, this whole progression and disease support management and being able to go back and figure out what's what happened in this episode where did it start what are we doing to managing it um, to prevent it and improve the outcome of that patient the next three attributes described by hymns are functions as a clinician's primary information resource during the provisions of patient care, assist with the work planning and delivery of evidence-based care, and lastly, supports continuous quality improvement and utilization review. And we've re reviewed all these different things and how all of this stuff is important from the data analytics, right? So if we have the good data input, then we can get good data output that can be analyzed by informatics personnel to make all of these cases and do the research to improve everything from quality to cost to better care. And 
lastly, we're capturing patient health related information that's needed for reimbursement. So re remember, everybody hates to talk about the cost of health care, but if we don't have a cost associated, if we can't get reimbursed, we can't provide the care in the first place. We can't buy new technologies. We can't fund the research. Um, longitudinally appropriately masked information to support clinical research. I was just talking about that and supporting of clinical trials. So in addition to all those identified in the HIMSS report, there's two additional attributes. Um, timely access by more than one person at a time. And that comes from, again, in the paper world, the physician has the chart and he may be in his locked physician room at the far end of the hall and I'm trying to take care of my patient you know, 500 feet on the other end of the hall. There's only one of us that can have that paper at a time. In the electronic world, I can be doing my thing, he can be doing his thing, he can be putting in orders while I'm delivering medications. We can all be in the same um, chart at the same time. It also helps to measure activity and determine levels of compliance with policies and evidence-based protocols. So I can have these reference texts built along with my orders where there's easy access for nursing care, particularly for new folks coming out of um, new healthcare professions that aren't as experienced. It's good to have reference material handy. All of these kinds of things, evidence-based, being able to go out and get the latest information can all be associated directly at the point of care with that patient in real time. So in addition to HIMSS, we also have the Health Level 7 International or HL7 report. And according to their website, HL7 is the ANSI or ANSI accredited standards developing organization dedicated to providing a comprehensive framework and related standards for the exchange, integration, sharing, and retrieval. What did I just say? Exchange, integration, sharing, and retrieval. How many of those words meet up with what we defined as informatics, right? Storage, retrieval, the collection, storage, and retrieval and disseminating of data. Same thing right here. That's what Health Level 7 is doing. And it's all for the delivery and evaluation of health services. So the functional model established for EHRs has a standards that enable the development of EHRs based on a set of functional requirements. And it contains three sections. It directs the care functions, the supportive functions, and the information infrastructure. So according to the EHRS model of Health Level 7, um, we're directing care functions that are functions employed in the provision of care to individual patients. Direct care functions are a set of functions, and these functions enable the delivery of health care or offer clinical decision support. There's that clinical decision support again, right? It's a subset of direct care functions that include care management, decision support, and operations management and communication. So all of these things are contained within this model. And examples of care management are the capability to identify and maintain the patient record, manage the demographics, and their problem lists. And for clinic decision support subsets, examples would be including support for standard care plans, guidelines, protocols, um, support for medication and immunization administration. Another word you might hear for protocols um, our, our physician physician directed care sets or something like that. There's some other terminology now coming out from protocols. But orders, referrals, results, and back to that, that care management example. Operations management and communications are clinical workflow tasking. So it's how are we having, how are we getting notified that there's a new drug ordered? How are we getting notified that the patient is scheduled to have some kind of therapies or radiology exam? How do we know that there's a lab test ordered and when it needs to be drawn? Those kinds of things. The HL7 EHR model also describes supportive functions as functions that support the delivery of optimized care but do not impact direct care. Those functions assist with administrative and financial requirements. So public health, global quality, all of those things follow into health level 7. So it's saying not only is it talking amongst the clinical providers for their notification, operations, and clinical decision support, and reference materials that are all available at the bedside, at the point of care, where multiple people can be in the EHR at the same time, providing care timely and effectively, but it's also saying globally and in public health and in research, this same Health Level 7 model can, is being used. And the final section that has to do with the information infrastructure functions are defined as a heuristic of 
of a system necessary for reliable, secure, and interoperable computing. So they're not just involved in the provision of health care, but it's also necessary to ensure that the information provides safeguards for patient safety, privacy, and information. Back to the HIPAA stuff. Um, in addition to the functions of the section, the security of the health record, registry and directory services, standard terminologies, terminology services, standard-based interoperability, business rules management, workflow management, and, and this relates back to patient safety, relates back to clinical decision support, because if we have our standard terminologies, standard services in place, um, and we're reporting out to the registries, it's just all, I, I don't know if you can even visualize with me the web that this, the spider of, that I'm talking about is weaving. So the Office of the National Coordinator for, Coordinator for Health Information Technology, which is the reason all of you are able to attend this class at the moment, included a following standard certification for EHR technology. So an EHR can be certified, and it has to have content exchange standards for exchanging electronic health information. An example of that is the National Council for Prescription Drug Programs, where they have a prescriber pharmacist interface based on HL7. Hmm, imagine that. Release 2 has the continuity of care document. There's vocabulary standards for representing the health, electronic health information, and examples of vocabulary, si, si, whew, vocabulary standards are the systemized nomenclature of medical clinical terms. That was the SNOMED CT, if you remember us using that, or the LOINC, lo, logical observation identifiers, names, and codes. Those are terminologies, remember, that have been used in clinical settings so that we're all kind of speaking the same language. We understand what, what everybody's talking about. Standards for health information technology to protect the electronic health information that's created and maintained. For example, encryption algorithms set by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. And the Federal Information Processing Standards, which has a, a hashing algorithm and a security strength equal or greater to the secure hash algorithm, which is SHA-1, and some of you may be more familiar with that than, than I am. This is getting pretty technical for me. But know that it's out there, and um, they've really tried to set some standards that are very high. So even though when we talk about this patient effect and, and patient care safety, we're talking about pers there's there's might be barriers to the adoption, and we're going to go over those in another lecture. But all of these benefits is what you need to weigh. The time and resources, what people are talking about barriers or resources, time, money resources, the training of end users, all of that in what the end result is with being able to adopt and implement an EHR. That there's respect to having an effect on patient care safety that includes this reducing the need to repeat tests, reducing the number of lost reports, and support provider decision making. And when we talked about doing that strategic planning in a couple lectures ago, and it all follows on a return of investment, right? If we do um, request for an RFP, we're going to look to see what the return on investment or the ROI is that goes with that RFP. We want to know what, are, what bang are we getting for our buck from resources to productivity to cost outlays to implement these things and what's it gonna what's in it for me as an organization in addition to what's in it for the patient and know that as cold as that sounds for what's in it for me what you're as the organization what you're looking at is if I can reduce those number of lost reports if I can increase my revenue because I've decreased my overhead then that savings get paid passed on to the patient and eventually more people can have access to health care So EHRs also have an effect on the efficiency by improving accessibility of patient information, which we talked about, integrating the data and facilitating the coordinating of healthcare. We've kind of beat, beat that horse quite a few times, but it's always worth repeating because that's really what the goal of what we're doing is. So 
how is an EMR EHR organized? Well, you've got several vendors, and we could spend all day talking about the different vendors. And, and basically what they've done is adopted a, a programming or form to where you can actually set your have views within your medical record for many of the vendors that will mimic whatever works for your organization as it flowed in paper. In some respects, we're, we can create the paper environment electronically. In other aspects, we don't want to create a paper environment electronically because it wasn't efficient on paper in any form. However, the way it can be organized um, is a logistic way of looking at it. And so we have these four ways of organizing an, an EMR. And the first one's integrated or sequential, might be date oriented, and that's chronological by date. And it's useful when you're trying to see the history of events. So an example would be, you've got a patient that has had migraines over the course of time. Well, if you could look at a, an integrated sequential record, you're going to see that on January 31st, that person was in a vehicle accident resulting in a head injury. February 4th, they came into the ER and were diagnosed with a migraine. February 6th, they were in the ER diagnosed with a migraine. February 7th, they followed up with a neurologist. February 7th, they got a, D a CT scan with the diagnosis of intracranial bleed. February 8th, they got neurosurgery. February 8th through the 14th, they're in inpatient rehab. And the end result is on March 1st, they had an ER visit with facial paralysis, which followed up with a neurologist for a diagnosis of Bell's palsy. But what you can see is that by the time it got to March 3rd, you can relate it back to January 31st because you have this chronological order of events that took place for this particular episodic event in this patient care. Okay, what, what was going on with this patient? You can tell that the migraines started as a result of an accident, which led to an intracranial bleed, which led to this Bell's palsy. So it's all related. Now, source-oriented has to do with the most common place you're going to see this is in an inpatient setting where you've got somebody you're, you're taking care of for a week at a time or a few days at a time. And what you need to know is you, you want to look at their labs from day to day, right? So you came in and maybe your, your blood count was low. So we need to see if that blood count's improved at all. So we want to just look at the labs. We want to see them all together. We don't we don't want to see everything that happened to you on day one and everything that happened to you on day two. We specifically want to look at the, the labs for the last two days. So we're going to organize it by lab, by radiology, by the progress notes, the nursing notes. So we can look at these in sections instead of chron Those individual source or oriented areas that are grouped are grouped chronologically. So you can look at them by date. But again, it's grouped by that um, specific source. Where is that information coming from? Where, where do you get that blood count? You get it from lab. Where do you get that x-ray result? You get it from radiology. So it's grouped by where the source of that information is. Problem-oriented is um, usually used in a physician office is where you're going to see this. And there's two reasons for it. The first um, usually can be because the physician is they're problem focused, right? They're managing long-term disease or maybe a specialist specialist doctor like a heart doctor. So they're really um, problem oriented because they're based on your cardiac issue, your problem with your heart and those related problems, whether that's hypertension or congestive heart failure that, that are all related to cardiac. Often used when somebody has multiple diagnoses in a primary care office. And a problem list follows closely with that. You usually have a problem list, which then results in the term problem-oriented. The problem list leads to these multiple diagnoses. So what are all your problems? Well, your problem list might be migraines, um, nosebleeds, and uh, dizzy spells, which actually are all related to the diagnosis of hypertension. Okay, or, or high blood pressure. What's important about this problem list is it's when it comes to reimbursement in physician's office particularly, they really have to be able to validate why they're um, ordering certain tests. So if you came into your doctor's office and you wanted a pregnancy test, you'd better have a problem list or a diagnosis of amenorrhea, which is missed periods, um, a diagnosis of uh, pregnancy based on something, 
Um, so they have to, so what is your problem? Your problem list is amenorrhea, you're sexually active, you're not on birth control, then insurance will pay for your pregnancy test. Um, insurance is not going to pay for a pregnancy test if you've had a full hysterectomy and you can't have children. See what I'm saying? So these different, that's an extreme case, but these different types of what we call ABNs or advanced beneficiary of notice of non-coverage are saying that there are certain tests, certain procedures that will not be covered, that Medicare and Medicaid services is deemed um, not reimbursable unless you have specific problems and sometimes even then they aren't. So we have to be very careful that, that we associate the problems and diagnosis appropriately. And that's why somebody might organize their chart that way. Then you have computer-based, which computer-based in one hand really isn't a, necessarily an organization of the EMR, EHR, but what it allows for, because it's in a digital form, it allows you to organize it for your needs. So if you have an electronic record, then your primary care doctor can look at it from a problem-oriented focus. When you go into the hospital, the hospitalist can look at it from a source-oriented perspective or view, and it, it allows you to customize that and be dynamic depending on the needs the provider has at the, during that course of care for the patient. Okay. Um, so how is this going to affect all of our patient outcomes? We've talked about research. We've talked about the public health components. We've talked about the continuity of care, the clinical decision support. I think it's pretty self-evident by this time that the EHR has the potential to improve quality, help providers practice better, be a repository of individual health records. It's intended to support efficient, high-quality, integrated health care. That's really what you need to do, what you need to know about it. So we've talked about the difference between an EMR and EHR, that it's at one facility versus across multiple facilities. Um, explain or organizations, the similarities and differences with the information and the attributes that they have, the functions of those attributes, how it can be organized to view it, and the impact it has on patient care. So you can move on to your assignments. If you have any questions, please let me know, and I will see you all on Friday. Thanks.